people ask me all the time, if you really want to get lasting change, real results that stick around, what do you got to do? What are the most important things you've learned, Tony, in that area? And I tell people the most common thing people talk about is how they want to make a change in their life. But everybody wants a change, but nobody wants to work out. You know, everybody wants muscle, but nobody wants to train. See, one of the challenges that we have in our lives is we don't realize that the process of training ourselves, the process of conditioning ourselves actually feels incredible once you get that initial momentum. But most people don't. Why? Why do so many people say, well, I lost 100 pounds, you know, the same 10 pounds 10 times, you know? Or they'll tell me, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm on my fourth day without a cigarette, man. I'm doing really good. If you're counting the days, it's not lasting change. You just count the days, you can tell people how long you lasted. If you want lasting change, you've got to give up this idea of trying something. You get to decide you're going to commit to mastery. I would like to start this morning by showing you the strategy for learning. What is learning? So if we take a human being, and uh, this will be a drawing of a human being, so you can see that again I majored in art. <laughs> Magnificent, isn't it? <laughs> so if we take a human being, and we want to be able to have them learn something, what is learning? Well, learning is the creation of, and here's the key word, of a relationship. Whenever you learn something, all you're really doing is creating a relationship between two things. So if I want to learn something, so how do I learn this? It's not figuring things out. That's how most of us think of learning. Learning is not figuring things out. Learning is the creation of a relationship between two things. Something you already know, the known. Something you already know, it's in your head already, you understand it. And a relationship between the known and the, what would you guess? The unknown. Because the minute you link something you understand to something you don't understand, you now understand what you didn't understand. So if you want to learn something, if you're not learning, it's not that you're not smart. It's not that you can't figure it out. It's that the person is explaining it using references you don't have. So I've learned things like quantum physics. I've learned things like nuclear power from physicists. But I'll say, okay, explain to me how that's like an orange, <laughs> right? How's that at least like a solar system? Something I understand. And sure enough, once they make that linkage, you got it. You understand the relationship, you understand what things are. Most of us lower our standards, why? Because who you spend time with, my friends, is who you become. One of the biggest reasons I started going to seminars when I was like 17 is I had nobody around me as a great role model. I could read about somebody, but being around people, being in that environment was very different. Finding a way to go to work with someone who lived that standard of life was very different. You get around people with low standards and you compete with it. You don't need to compete with it. It's like, okay. I mean, remember Jerry Springer? I don't know if he's still in the air, but you know, I remember he used to get people on the show and I thought, where would he find these people? <laughs> and why would people watch? I'll tell you why they watch. They watch these people and go, my life's still pretty darn good compared to that person. Look at them. You don't have to change your life. All you have to do is find somebody with a lower standard and you'll feel good about yourself. But if you feel that good feeling, it's an illusion. The only thing that's going to make you happy, my friend, and this year or any other, is to step up. It's to raise the standard, it's to discover what you're capable of and feel that incredible power of pushing through whatever's holding you back and get to the other side of more of your true self. That's what this game's all about. How many of you can think of something you feel excited about right now? Raise your hand, let me see your hand. Say I. When you're really excited about it, what about that excites you? Or when you're really excited, how do you feel? How do you speak? What's your life like? By the way, when you're excited, does it tend to touch other people, yes or no? Absolutely. By the way, do people have a tendency, but who feels different right now than just even a couple moments ago? Raise your hand and say, I. Why? Because focus is controlled by questions. If you ask a different question continuously, not once, continuously, you will get a different answer. If you ask a lousy question, you get a lousy answer in a lousy state. Somebody says, why does this always happen to me? It doesn't always happen to you, but the brain's like a computer. Ask it a question, it'll have to come up with an answer. Because you deserve it, you idiot. Once you break through, then it just becomes a game. The people that are getting your products have not yet broken through in most cases. The breakthrough happens by conditioning your mind every day, by feeding it a role model or story. It's putting yourself in a peak state where you fall through by getting physically strong. It's creating a little ritual of doing a little bit each day, and then you get momentum. But the most important thing of all is what we started out with. Why? Absolutely. Why is it a must for you? 
It doesn't have to be you're against the wall, but it has to be something you're hungry for, because the only difference in people is hunger. And if you're not hungry, get around people that are hungry and something will hit you. If you don't like the way your career is or your business is, change it. If you don't like your body, change it. You don't like your relationship, change you first, because if you change it, you'll bring you to the next one. Maybe it's time to change it too, but change yourself first. If you want to change anything in your life, you have the choice. So there is no right or wrong. I just want to make you aware in this breakthrough session, that everything in our life changes the moment we make a decision. And I mean a real decision. A decision is when you cut off any other possibility and you commit to something with everything you've got and you take action. But the big decisions start with little decisions like what am I gonna focus on? Because whatever you focus on, you're gonna feel. You're gonna learn to drive a stick shift car and you're brand new at driving a car. Who can remember this experience? And was it overwhelming, yes or no? Why? Because driving a car today, for most of you, is one chunk of information. I'm gonna go drive. That's it. Because most of what you've done, you got cognitive knowledge about, you repeated it enough with enough emotion, you did it enough in your body, now all of those complex things happen and what you call it is just driving. But the first time you were driving, it was a lot of different activities. I can remember, they called me Speed Racer because I couldn't figure out how to get anything going. I got in the car, you know, okay, accelerate or brake, got that, watch the road, and I'm supposed to do this too? And watch the rear view mirror? No, 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 they, this ain't happening, right? Because it was overwhelming. Because what it was, was one chunk of you was figuring out how to accelerate, one part of you brake, another part of you's gotta watch the road, another one's watching the rear view mirror, another one's gotta figure out the timing of moving this in. But after a while, it just became driving. And most of you drive today, literally, on automatic pilot. Because many of you, how many have ever done this? You're driving along, and all of a sudden your mind goes somewhere else, and all of a sudden you go, who's been driving? <laughs> who's had that experience before? Say, I. I. Well, who's been driving is your subconscious mind, the part of you that makes your heart beat 100,000 times a day without you having to think about it even when you're sleeping. And your subconscious absorbs way more when you're in a position of total absorption like you are here, immersion, more than your conscious mind does. Oh. I'm very clear that I believe that life is about leadership and being truthful to yourself. And so I believe, number one, that the mandate for any great relationship and the mandate for anybody to lead their own life and not be a follower is you gotta see things as they are, but not worse than they are. Because that's where most people go. That's where they go in relationship, that's why they start to tear it down, that's why the relationship starts to break down because people get scared when it isn't working out and then they make it worse than it is so they don't have to try because they don't want to try again and be disappointed. They don't want to feel that sense of rejection. They don't want to feel that sense of failure. So most people make it much worse than it is. 80% of success in life, 80% of achievement in business, 80% of almost anything that matters in your life is psychology and 20% is mechanics. And I'm here to tell you there's two things that control everything in your life. Every thought, Every feeling, every emotion, every action you have in your life, what you're wearing today, whether you're going to turn this off within a few minutes or whether you're going to stick with me here for two or three minutes, is all controlled by two things, your beliefs and your values. Whatever you believe, if you think life is just a waste of time, doesn't matter what you do, or you know, you're big boned, then obviously you're not going to go for it, you're not going to try to lose weight, you're not going to go push for that next level. Beliefs control us, but so do our values. Some people, you know, value just kicking back. Some people value making it happen. Some people value their family the most. Some people value love. But you know what the real challenge is? When we have values in conflict. When you really want to make a difference in the world or you really want to do well for your family or you really want to do well financially, but simultaneously, you know, you don't want to upset anybody. You want to be totally honest and you want to make everybody happy. When we have conflicts between what we want and what we think we can have or you know, you have a goal of what you really want to make happen, but then you have this other belief inside that says, this damn stuff never does work. Those inner conflicts are what keep people from using all of their energy. It's kind of like taking two steps forward and three steps back. So often in life, people don't begin the journey because they're not quite sure what to do or how to do it right or how to do it perfect. If you want to change your body, get yourself moving. Don't wait for the perfect trainer. Just go out there and move. Put on your shoes and move and get momentum. Just remember, progress equals happiness. If you can start to make progress, if you can get yourself going, even if it's not perfect, if it doesn't work, 
You know what to do, just change your approach. If that doesn't work, change your approach. But if there's anything that'll shift your life, that'll get you to thrive in a difficult situation, is take some massive action, try something else. Change it, try it, move it. I'm honored and I'm blown away, even though this is my 25th year plus doing this. I've been doing this for a quarter of a century now, which is quite amazing for me in the process. Thank you. And I've had the privilege now of working with more than three million people live in events from more than 80 countries around the world. So at this stage, I gotta tell you something, I could be an idiot and I would know that there are certain patterns that cause people to be fulfilled, to be happy, to fit, to be strong, to feel alive, to be vibrant, to have passion in their life, to do well financially, but even more importantly, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, in their health and their relationships. And there are also patterns that make people frustrated, overwhelmed, depressed, sad, lonely, cause them to be struggling financially, struggling with their body, struggling intimately. And those patterns, they're not because there's something wrong with somebody, it's because of a pattern that we're doing. And I spent a quarter of a century of my life basically studying the most successful people in the world and the most challenged. And figuring out what's the fastest way to create a change in basically developing the one thing that all people have in common who succeed, their leaders. This is a leadership program. Because I don't care what, what style you are, I don't care if you're a mom, if you're a great mom, you lead your child, you're not led by your child, or a great dad. If you're a great business person, you're a great salesperson, you're a great negotiator, you're a great anything, you're a great human being. This has been my entire life's obsession. What makes the difference in people's lives? And that leadership component, as I say, doesn't always mean somebody follows you. A leader is somebody who lives life on their terms that you will never settle for less than you can be or share or give or create. It's not what we get that makes us happy, it's who we become. See, all the results in your life are coming from your rituals. They start with a standard and then have rituals that follow it up. Like for example, if you are where you wanna be physically, you have very different rituals than if you're not where you wanna be physically. If you're overweight, you and I both know you got a different ritual than if you're physically fit. Completely different. You get up in the morning, what's the first thing you do if you're fit? Your shoes are there, you roll over, doesn't matter how you feel, you put on your shoes, you lace and you start walking or whatever that ritual is. If you're overweight, you roll over and you have a very different ritual. You might roll over several times to turn the alarm clock off. You go in and get your mocha, smoka, whatever, you know, special coffee. You stop by at Starbucks, whatever the case may be. You have your nice sugar muffin, you know, that's supposed to be really nice for you. Whatever you do, it's a different ritual. If you have a great, passionate relationship, you have very different rituals in how you come home than if you have a lousy relationship. When you come home and the first thing you do is you're tweeting somebody or you're emailing or flipping on the news or you don't even come home. And what are the rituals? Whenever I study people that are successful, what I look for is what's the standard they hold themselves to? And then what are all those little rituals that up? Because think about it. Success and failure are not giant events. They don't just show up. You don't just suddenly become successful or suddenly have this cataclysmic event that makes you fail. It may look that way, but failure comes from all the little things. It's failure to make the call. It's failure to check the books. It's failure to say, I'm sorry. It's failure to push yourself to do things physically that you don't want to do. And all those little failures day after day come together until one day some cataclysmic event happens and you blame that. That event happened because you missed all the little stuff. And then I thought, you know, years I figured out, our whole life is shaped by decisions. That's what we've talked about today, right? But there's three decisions you're making every moment you're alive. And the way you make these three decisions shapes your destiny. First decision we're all making every moment is what are you gonna focus on? What are you gonna focus on? And you know, I realized that my father's life and my life ended up very different because we made that day three decisions very differently. He decided to focus on the fact that he has not fed his family. And the second question you gotta decide, every moment you're alive, including this moment, what are you gonna focus on? Second question is, as you're focusing on, what does this mean? What does it mean? And the bottom line on meaning is, if you think about it, you get to make up the meaning, and most people pick the worst one, don't they? That day, my father decided to focus on the fact he hadn't fed his family, and I know what meaning he gave because he said it out loud over and over again, that he was worthless because he had not taken care of his family. And then the final, most important decision you make every moment you're alive, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? And I'll tell you what he decided to do. He decided to leave our family shortly thereafter, which at the time was 
It was the worst experience of my life. It was the most crushing experience I felt. It's been so many years now, I don't have the same feelings. And part of it is three years ago, he passed away. But at the time, I knew no greater pain. My family knew no greater pain. I couldn't understand why he would leave. I loved him so much. And my life turned out very different than him. I was the only one to go to his funeral. No one else in the family would go. Nobody wanted to be part of it. He died alone of a disease called connective tissue disorder. And I can tell you right before his death, he got the lesson because he looked at me and he said, son, he said, I was a bastard. I didn't connect with anybody and look what I'm dying of. It's unbelievable. Change happens in a moment. A breakthrough happens in a moment. What is a breakthrough? A breakthrough is that moment in time where suddenly the impossible becomes possible. Not just intellectually, but you do something about it. You know, people all the time will say it takes 10 years or it took me 20 years to make a change. I always say BS. It took you a minute. The minute you finally said, I quit or it's over or let's begin or I love you or I do, change happens in a moment, but most of us have to go through a process to get to that moment. And what I'm mind dedicated to is having you get to that moment much quicker. Got a sort of five point plan that anyone can follow to get over stress and trauma in their lives. Talk me through it. Well, I think, it, first of all, I want to make one thing clear. The quality of your life is the quality of where you live emotionally. Like we all have a home. Angry people find a way to get angry, even if their life doesn't have anything to be angry about. We can always find it. Sad people find a way to be sad. Caring people find a way to care for other people. So one thing you've got to identify is where are you living? What's your home? What's your habit? And then the way to change it is that when I was homeless, literally on my own just getting started, I didn't have the internet, but I decided I had to go to a library and I had to feed my mind. And I always tell people the first stage is, you know, weeds grow automatically. Uh, one of my teachers taught me, he said, every day stand guard at the door of your mind and feed it something good. Because if your worst enemy puts sugar in your coffee here, you're fine. If your best friend by accident trying to help you put some strychnine, you're dead. So if you feed your mind every day, 30 minutes a day of reading something, hearing something, second, you got to strengthen your body. And the reason, Pierce, is fear is physical, right? So is stagnation, so is numbness, so is sadness, so is rage. And when you go in and change your body by an intense workout or a run or even an intense walk and the blood's flowing through you, science has shown it instantly changes your biochemistry. And now your mind and body are working together. Third thing, all these people did in common, if you watch, they found a mission bigger than themselves. Yeah. Something that they wanted to aspire to that was worth more than their pain. And then the fourth thing is, you gotta find a role model. You know, you heard it with Nick. Um, almost everybody finds a role model that makes it real. I was with uh, Warren Buffett and with Sarah Blakely, the youngest uh, billionaire. We did this round table about the future. And when you listen to this woman, when women meet her, they don't just love Spanx or product that made her a billionaire. They love this woman because she's a role model of what's possible. Yeah. When you get a role model, it becomes real to you. If you get a plan, you get a goal plan, and you take massive action. And the last step, number five, there's always somebody all worse off than you are. I don't care what you've done. So if you can go help somebody worse off, it puts your life in perspective. And it also reminds you life's not about me, it's about we. I always tell people, the secret to a great life, the secret to living is giving. And there's, when you realize there's something in you still to give, even if you lost your legs, even if you've been through a horrific financial situation, your life can improve. But more importantly, you'll have a meaningful life because your life will contribute to other people. I tell people one thing. If you're not happy in your intimate relationship, you're not fucking happy. Because I don't give a shit how hard you work. I don't care how much money you make, how many trophies you get. In the end, if you don't have that aliveness and passion, a part of you is dead inside. The more you can cultivate that sense of wealth, that sense of abundance in you, the more you can feel that sense of joy, the more easy it's gonna be for you to do financially. Because you're not gonna be in this scarce, fearful mode. Now that's not enough by itself. You can have this great sense of abundance and do the wrong mechanics and be a disaster, true or false. But if I had a, they have an area to get you started with, you wanna have the emotion and psychological strength because that's gonna carry you through when the mechanics are boring or frustrating or when things aren't working out. Your emotion, your psychology is what'll carry you. It'll get you to keep doing it. The best way to deal with shame for people is to find what you're most proud of. You can't, you're never gonna deal with shame. You have to overwhelm it with the good. It's kind of like if every day of your life you look around and you let it happen, news comes in, and it's almost always these days something to scare you. If it bleeds, right. it leads, they say in the newspaper business, right? <laughs> right? So something to jar you. If you're gonna have your life, you have to what I call stack the good. You have to flood yourself with the good. You have to say, what am I proud of in my life? What am I grateful for? And you've gotta literally think of three or four or five things, people, experiences. It could be something little you're proud of when you're a kid, something today. But if you do what I call an emotional flood, 
you flood yourself with all the beautiful, proud things, things you're grateful for in your life, you'll find that'll overwhelm that feeling of shame and the shame feeling will disappear. But it won't disappear by analyzing it. Right, right, right. And then you just get more in your, more no, in your I head. I like this idea of yeah, flooding you it You flood in. it. And when right. you flood it, and you do this, I can see you do this. You're a person, you look for the good, you find the good and you stack it. Yeah. And that's what gives you so much energy. Decide to develop the habit right now the habit of focusing on what's right in your world instead of what's wrong. The habit of focusing on what you do have instead of what you don't have in a situation. And as basic as that is and as well as you know it, you've got to make it a habit. Because those habits form the chain of your ultimate character, of who you become and how you end up living your life. We've got to condition ourselves because if we don't, we'll go back to the automatic state that most people live in in today's society. The way to develop the habit is to go on a mental diet. I did this several years ago. As positive as I was, and I was going through unbelievable pain at the time. I'd had some major disappointments, some frustrations. I felt like I'd given it all. But what turned me around is one day I picked up this book called The Seven Day Mental Diet. It was a little tiny little booklet. And all the booklet really did was, for about 12 of the 14 pages, it challenged me to really see if I could really truly, for seven days, live my life without one negative thought. And it kept saying throughout the book, now don't just say, yeah, I can do it. And don't just say, I'm going to do it. Think for a while before you commit to this. Don't actually commit unless you're really going to do it for seven straight days, no matter what. It doesn't mean you don't have a negative thought. It just means that if you have a negative thought, you don't speak it. You set it aside. You forget about it. Or you replace it. If you say something negative, you go erase. What I really mean is this. Or you say, that's not what I mean. Here's what I mean is this. And you immediately focus on something good. It's not that nothing negative ever comes out. It's that you immediately do not allow yourself to hold a negative feeling, a negative thought for seven straight days, day and night, even when it gets tough, even when somebody disappoints you, even when you get frustrated, even when you give your all and it still turns up lousy. Listen, if all I did was rant and rave on this tape and you didn't listen to anything else I said, but you took on this seven day challenge, you can't believe what it'll do to your life. You know, we're living in a society where nobody moves anymore. What do we like today? How do people get injured today? They don't get injured smashing into people playing football and anything else. They get injured typing, right? You know, picking up a pencil. Oh, oh, they're really, oh. That's how people get hurt today because we don't use everything anymore. We live in a box. Think about it. Think about our lives today and how different it is than maybe the way we were formed to be made. To run, to hunt, to create, to procreate, to raise our children, to move, to farm, to do all the things that made us use all of our body. Today, what do we do? You wake up and you have this box life. You have a box breakfast, right? You get in your box car, you drive to your box office, you load up a box elevator. You don't use the stairs, of course, right? You go to your box office where you type on a box, talk on a box, right? Go into a box room for meetings, right? Sure enough, got a little box you can type on, listen to, listen to music on, box, have your box lunch, Drive your box home or get in the train or subway and another box home. Get home to your box and then turn on the box. (laughs) Type on a box, message on a box. I mean, and maybe go get a cylinder to change your state, (laughs) right? Maybe. (laughs) And most people's idea of exercise in our society today is fill the tub, pull the plug and fight the current. (laughs) That's the world we live in today. And so it's not hard to figure out why we're getting fat and why we're finally kind of tired and why we're building up acid in our system, consuming foods that have nothing alive in them anymore. I will do something that I still do backstage and have done for 23 years because I don't hope I'm going to be in a good state. I demand it. So I do an incantation using my whole body. I'd say, I now command my subconscious mind to direct me in helping as many people as possible alive today to better their lives by giving me the strength, the emotion, the persuasion, the humor, the brevity, whatever it takes to show these people and get these people to change their lives now. And I would do that literally driving in my Volkswagen to a meeting in LA on the freeway for 40 minutes. People are looking at me, I'm screaming at the top of my lungs. They're going, I know he's a serial killer. I know he is. But by the time I entered that room, when two people meet, if there's rapport, The person who's most certain will always influence the other person. And I was totally certain, and they were trying to get revved up to certainty. Do you agree with this? Yes or no? I do another one because I was poor. I changed my mindset. I kept doing things, but I never got beyond it. I'd say God's wealth is circulating in my life. His wealth flows to me in avalanches of abundance. All my needs, desires, and goals are met instantaneously by infinite intelligence. For I'm one with God, and God is everything. 
And I would imagine the abundance in my life and I would feel so grateful. And a year later I went from making $38,000 a year to making a million dollars a year in one year. But successful people do what failures won't. You follow me on this? You know? If you get yourself in a state of certainty that this is going to work, I'm going to find the way. And if this doesn't work, I will make the way. Then you tap a lot more potential. And when you're certain in your potential, you take massive action. When you take massive action, you really believe in something, you get great results. When you get great results, your brain goes, see, I told you I was a stud. People tell me all the time, oh, I'm skeptical or I'm pessimistic. I said, no, 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 you're gutless. It takes no guts, it takes no courage to be a pessimist, to say it's not going to work, to try to find out what's wrong. What's wrong is always available. It's always what's right. So I'm not into positive thinking, but I am into intelligence. And intelligence says, see it as it is, don't make it worse than it is. I Meet people all the time and say, I'm, my problem is I'm big bone. No, you're freaking fat, tell the truth. You know, what is this big bone story, you know? The only way it gets better is if you can see how it is. Don't make it worse than it is. Don't try to make it so it's impossible to change. That's not true. It's not true at all. The second mandate, I think, to changing anything in your life, to leading your life, is once you see it as it is, not worse than it is, then you got to see it better than it is. Because that's the thing that's missing for most relationships. There's no vision. I mean, without a vision, in the Bible it says, people what? Perish. And when a relationship has no vision for greater than where they are, that relationship is going downhill, if not destroyed. I believe that every relationship, every part of life, every part of a human being needs a compelling future. If the future's not more compelling than today, today could be tough, but if the future's compelling, we can get there. So just to remind you, first thing you gotta do is feed and strengthen that mind. Read, listen, feed the mind, take control of that focus, stand guard at what other people are saying, focus on what it is you're here to give, what you can control, what you can make happen. Number two, feed and strengthen that body. Remember, fear, uncertainty, they're physical experiences. So the best way to deal with something physical is get physical. Change that body. Go lift some weights. Go for that run. Do something that's going to get you in that state. If you've been to our seminars, you know exactly what to do. But get that hour of power going, that 15 minutes to thrive, if you're familiar with that, to train your body and mind to be strong again. Number three, make sure you put yourself in that position where you find a role model that's going to inspire you and show you that way. Maybe it's a contrasting role model. You think your life's so tough? Find somebody with tougher who's really turned it around. Or maybe it's just somebody who's really succeeded that you can now see there is a way. There's a way through. There's a way to make this happen, even in the toughest times. There's always a way. Four, make sure you get yourself into action. Get a plan. Take massive action. And then number five, most importantly of all of them, feed your spirit. Feed and strengthen your spirit. And there's only one way to do that. It's to find what you're grateful for and to take time, whether it be prayer for you or just taking a moment to think about what it is that's so lucky in your life. There's, there's a rejuvenation in our spirit when we stop taking things for granted. And when most importantly, what feeds your spirit is to give, to find a way to do something for someone else who's worse off than you are. Because what is this all about? It's about strength, and it's about perspective, it's about action, it's about emotion, and it's about heart. And so many people, you know, miss the opportunity to feel like their life makes a difference. I'm a big believer that motive does matter, that why you do something, people can feel. That people may be skeptical, they may have their judgments or their fears because they've been through so much, but in my experience, ultimately, why you're doing something people feel and if you're doing this because some part of you knows that you're here in life not just to get but to give then there's a spark that happens in other people because they feel the genuineness of that and there's a spark that happens in you because it reminds you what you're made for whenever you don't learn it's because someone is trying to teach you in a different way and the different way is i, I was a good student in school i liked learning until i got to junior high school high school where I liked all subjects until I got to there when math became algebra, geometry, and trigonometry. Because when I got there, I totally hated it. So I had no motivation to really learn it. And with no drive to learn something, you don't. Who you spend time with is who you become. Uh, and getting yourself in proximity with people that are succeeding, even if you have to work for free for somebody, get in the environment around them, it rubs off on you. You begin to think like they think. You begin to see what the opportunities are. One of the challenges in our country is when people are really doing poorly, we put them together in an environment where other people are doing poorly, and we wonder why they don't get better. No amount of money will ever make you wealthy, because as soon as you get there, 
you will raise the game. Now here's what's great about that, to continue growing in all areas of life. If you could grow emotionally, should you, yes or no? Yes. If you could give more, should you, yes or no? Yes. If you grow intellectually, should you? Yes. If you could give more love, should you? Yes. If you could grow more financially, should you? Yes. yes, because growth is life. But having to grow in order to feel significant enough means you will always be poor. It's a game that never ends. Let's talk about money now, not wealth. What does it take mechanically to get this thing called financial independence? And what is financial independence as opposed to wealth? Wealth is a product of the mind. Again, no amount of money you ever achieve will make you wealthy. Financial independence means you never have to work again in order to live your life. That when you do work, you're doing it because you really want to, not because you have to. And how many are committed to not only being wealthy, but also financially independent? Say, ah! Life will pay whatever price you ask of it. But you know what's interesting? You gotta ask intelligently. In the Bible it says, ask and you shall what? Pretty good formula, you ought to look into it. But you know what? It says, ask and you shall receive, but I'm sure it meant ask intelligently. I'm sure that's what God meant. I'm sure he didn't mean bitch and you will receive. Wine and you will receive. I don't think that was the instruction. Now, if you were going to ask intelligently, there might be five elements of that. Number one, you'd have to ask specifically, wouldn't you? You wouldn't ask in a general way. People do it all the time. They go, I want more money. Fine, here's a dollar. Get out of here. Very often, you're getting what you're asking for. You're just not aware of how general you're asking. Clarity is power. The more clear you are about exactly what it is you want, the more your brain knows how to get there. Your brain is a servo mechanism. It's like a bomb. Those bombs, those missiles, they have a servo mechanism. So if the target moves, it knows what the target is, it follows it. Your brain, when you condition it, knows exactly what to go for and it'll find a way to get there. Do you ever buy a certain outfit or a certain car and suddenly see that car outfit everywhere? How many of you ever had that experience? Say, aye. How come that car outfit's everywhere? It always was everywhere, but now you notice it. And the reason is because there's a part of your brain called the reticular activating system, the RAS. That part of your brain determines what you notice and what you don't notice. Your brain spends most of its time trying to make sure you don't notice because you'll go crazy if you notice everything. But when you decide what's most important to you, your brain goes after it. Everyone I know who's successful builds what I call an RPM plan. An RPM is built on the metaphor that the way to get from where you are to where do you want to go to the fastest is you've got to build power like in a car, RPMs. And the R stands for they know the result they're after. They know what they want precisely. If you don't know exactly what you want or you let yourself get beyond that into something general, you're not going to achieve it. We all have goals. The problem, as I've said before in this program, is that we're unconscious in the use of our resources. Most people's goals are to, quote, pay the lousy bills or to get by or to survive or get out of debt or make it through the day, make the relationship a little better, get a better job. In short, they're caught up in the trap of making a living rather than designing a life. Remember that our goals affect us, whatever they are. If we don't consciously plant the seeds of what we want in the gardens of our minds, we'll end up with weeds. If we want to discover the unlimited possibilities within us, we must find a goal big enough and grand enough to challenge us to push beyond our limits and discover our true potential. Remember that your current conditions do not reflect your ultimate potential, but rather the size and the quality of the goals upon which you're currently focusing. We all must discover or create a magnificent obsession. Whenever you look at somebody and say, why are they more successful than anybody else? It's always because of step one, they've raised their standard. If you go back home and you want to change your life in any way, personally, professionally, or your company, as boring as it sounds, as stupid as it ain't it sounds, you might say, I spent all this time, this energy, this money, and you're going to tell me to raise my standards? Yes. Because even though that's not sexy, it is the only thing that creates lasting change. You can go on a diet and you can lose weight, but what will that person eventually do? They'll go where? Back, unless they raise their standard. Now that sounds so trite and stupid and positive thinky or old school. But the truth is, it's the truth. So maybe I can language it in a way that's more compelling to you or more simple. What does it mean when we say raise our standards? It means you turn your shoulds in the must. The difference in people is that they turn their shoulds into must. The things that you used to say I should do, you do your shoulds when it's convenient, when it's comfortable, when it goes your way. But when something is a must, not to other people, but a must to you, do you find the way to get it done, yes or no? 
So the difference in people is what's their must, or another word for that is what's their standard. Because here's what leaders really do. They maximize resources. A leader can come into an organization that's totally torn up in horrible shape, take the same resources, take it to another level. Your body, your mind, your emotion, but you can't maximize it when you're trying to fit in. And you can't maximize it when you live by everybody else's rules. I'm not saying don't be respectful. I'm just saying as a leader, you've got to decide what you believe is right. And one thing I can tell you will always feel right, to never settle for less than you can be, do, share, or give. That'll feel right as long as you do inside your life. Oh, yes. The greatest investors, the greatest financial success in history, the first man to become a billionaire by investing alone is a man who was a friend of mine. He died about four years ago named Sir John Templeton. Sir John Templeton started out with nothing. He wasn't Sir John. He was a guy that basically grew up in this tiny little town with nothing to his name. He worked hard and he decided to save his money and find a way to invest. But he had one cool secret. He realized when things are going well, what do people want for their property when things are going really well? A high price or a low price? Which one? High price. When things are going well, do they want a high price or a low price for their shares? Which one? High price. When things are going unhappy, when things are terrible, when things are going well, people think it's going to go well forever. When they think it's going bad, they think it's going to go bad for how long? Forever. When things are going really poor, what does that guy want for his shares or his home? A high price or whatever he can get? Which one? Whatever he can get. So his mindset was really simple. I'm going to make all my money, write this down, during times of maximum pessimism. I'll make all my money during times of maximum pessimism. If you can, when everybody else is freaking out, seeing it worse than it is, you can see how it really is, not kid yourself, not just be positive, but see it better than it is and see where the advantage is. And you can do the third step I left out, which is once you see it better than it is, you've got to make it that way. You've got to come up with a strategy and action plan to make it that way. If you can do those three things, you can take advantage. And he if you want a great jump in the quality of your life, an extraordinary jump in the quality of your life, you've got to set yourself up to win. You gotta set yourself up with a process that allows you to consistently grow, consistently enjoy your life, and consistently produce the results that you're really after. And I don't care. But if you've got what you know that focus, the target, and you got the toolbox and you're still not getting what you want, it's because you got inner conflicts. That's the third pillar. You've got to resolve your inner conflicts. Because that as I try to explain to you, eighty percent of success in anything is your psychology and twenty percent is the mechanics. So those inner conflicts are when you take two steps forward and you pull three steps back, right? When you say, boy, I'm totally committed to this, but you don't follow through. This is my expertise, the why guy part. Why? Why do you keep saying you want this? You have crystal clarity and you have the tools and you're still not getting it. There's a conflict in you. You want to be totally successful, but you're afraid at some level that if you will are totally successful, you will not be loved. You'll be rejected. You want to be in a position where you have total free time and you want to build a billion dollar enterprise. These are conflicts. You really truly know you got the tools and talents to make this happen, but a part of you doesn't think you deserve to succeed because of something you did at some point in your life or something you made up. Or you think making money or being successful economically is not spiritual and you're committed to being spiritual and yet the other part of you, it's the inner conflicts between fighting parts. So what do we do in this third pillar? Think of it as a vault we got to unlock. Think of it as unlock and unleash. That's the third pillar. The way you unlock and unleash is you identify the conflicts. You get clear what they are. So you may have total clarity, even the tools, but how can you totally unleash and commit when you're being pulled in two different directions? You say, Tony, how do I solve that? There isn't one way. You've got to get clear about what's most important to you today not what you think you should do based on an old blueprint, an old belief system, your parents, society, your friends. Otherwise, you'll succeed and not be fulfilled. So once you identify the conflicts, now what you got to do is align. Align your life with what you really value. Align your life with what is most important to you. And then once you are in a position where you're aligned, guess what you'll do? Take action. You won't even have to work at it. When everything's in alignment, there's nothing pulling you away, boom, you go for it. But when you say, I want a relationship, but at the same time, simultaneously, I want to be in a position where, you know, uh, I never have to, you know, I only get what I want every moment, or I never have to commit to anything, 
then obviously you're never going to get there. That inner conflict must be resolved. Once you align and you take action, guess what's going to happen? You're going to achieve. And once you achieve, you succeed. When you succeed, I'll tell you what you got to add to it. Celebrate, right? And then contribute. Pay it forward, if you will, as corny as that sounds. Remember the movie? Pay it forward. Don't pay it back. Take what you've got, what you've learned, and bring it to someone else. And if you bring it to someone else, it continues that cycle of fulfillment, of joy, of meaning in your life. Everything works. Uh, I just finished by reminding you what I think everybody knows in their heart. Nothing you get will ever make you happy. Nothing. Doesn't matter how many people respect you, how much money you have, how many things you have. We all know that. But who you become will make you very happy or very sad. And so ultimately, there's one way to test your life. In the busyness of your life, make sure you take just a few minutes to give yourself the gift of making progress every day. Because that's the one word that'll make you happy. Progress. Doesn't matter what you achieve. Feels good for how long. You know, you got it. It's wonderful. It's exciting. You appreciate it. And then you move on. But if you're still growing, if you're not growing, you're dying. If you're making progress, if you're not where you want to be physically, but all of a sudden you took this book and you started to make some simple changes and you started to walk, move, exercise, you make a couple dietary changes, you got some energy now and you start feeling every day, even if you're not yet to the 30 pounds you want to lose, just the momentum will make you happy. If you're in a relationship where you're settling or you're in a relationship where you're not in a relationship and you're settling for being alone when something inside of you craves more, and this book triggers you and gives you the plan on how to finally connect and break through your own fears and connect with people and light them up the way you really want to, uh, just even before you're there, just the progress will light you up. And we all have to keep growing to feel that alive. So whether it be progress in your business, progress in your body, progress in your energy, your relationship, your kids, your finances, your career, I don't care what it is, that's what my life's about. So my heartfelt wish for you is this video becomes a trigger for more progress. And that out of that progress, you'll have things that you enjoy in your life that you'll now be able to give to other people too. So please pass along your stories, I'd love to hear. Pass along to other people and let them know what this has meant to you. And let's see if we can, through this trigger of, of the social networks and, and social media and email and everything else that we have, texting, let's see if we can just spread this around and really touch a lot of lives. You'll get then the same joy I get, which is people coming up saying, oh my God, you changed my life. I don't change anybody's life, they do it for themselves, but I provide the triggers and you can be my partner in providing the triggers. So blessings to you. Bula from Fiji, live strong, live with passion, and God bless.